Hey, good morning, everybody. What a nice day outside. I mean, have you seen that color outside in a while in the morning? It's blue skies. I know Jeannie Jackson, who's waiting to talk to you, Mendenoma Sightings, uh, is right here with me. And because we live in Anchor Bay, we have seen some blue skies in the afternoon, including a little bit of heat occasionally. But down here at the coast, see the beautiful blue skies and uh, who knows what it means for the weather. Mid, not low 60s. I mean, I'm just going to guess. I mean, it's not like. It's not like it's August <laughs> around the world nation where it's hot. Anyway, so today is going to be men to know sightings. Let me give you a couple of quick announcements here. And I do want to uh, remind you, you just heard uh, the men to medication take back event promo. I just want to remind you again, that is today a drive through event. If you have uh, extra or expired, you know, medications at home, today's the right day to Take them to the Gualala Community Pharmacy from 9 to 12 uh, and in Point Arena in front of the bus stop on Main Street from 1230 to 3. So get rid of those excess drugs that are sitting around there expired and you never know who, how they might get in the wrong hands. And that means pets too, you know, the pets are very curious. I don't know about your pets. Mine, they see a pill, they think food, you know, <laughs> eat it. Uh, anyway. And you can help our local seniors age in place and have some fun. The Coastal Seniors needs some bus drivers. If you're willing to help drive around some of our fun seniors, uh, give them a call at 882-2137, 882-2137, or send an email to director at coastalseniors.org. And what else we got here? Just a quick reminder. In case you haven't heard, uh, the Studio Discovery Tour starts this Saturday through September 4th. So it's this coming weekend and the Labor Day weekend Studio Discovery Tour. Go and visit so many of our wonderful Mendenoma artists in many of their own um, studios. There might be one, two or three artists distrib uh, together. Always fun. You can pick up this brochure. This brochure comes with a map so you'll know where to go. You get to drive up and down the coast. It's a lot of fun every year. And last but not least, this person, Peggy Burial, is going to be introducing you tomorrow on Peggy's Place to the new management at the Sea Ranch Lodge with their new GM, Christina Jetton or Jetton, I'll find out exactly how to, uh, in, you know, introduce it tomorrow, but she will be with me tomorrow. And we're going to ask uh, questions about what's going on at the lodge because everyone's curious. Aren't you curious, Jeannie? I certainly am. I hear they're going to open pretty soon. There you go. See, curious minds want to know, Christina. So Jetton, Christina Jetton, thank you. So um, that's tomorrow. And one other important reminder, we are live on YouTube. And so uh, Jeannie and I, we decided that we'd better get out of our jammies this morning and <laughs> look a little nice. <laughs> it's not radio today only. So on live on KGUA.org, on uh, the TuneIn app, Radio Garden, uh, our very own Air Pocket app. Oop, where'd Jeannie go? And we're live on KGUA's YouTube. Just go to YouTube and... Uh, you know, Google KGUA YouTube and you will see us live. We got, we're going to get started with some photos. So Jeannie, we just had one month when you and I got to sit opposite each other. Uh, I know. It's so, so disappointing. <laughs> it, it is. It is. And, uh, you know, uh, same thing, Carolyn Ducato. I got to have one month, la one day last month with her and we did the same thing yesterday you know, sharing food by distance, which was okay. This is okay. We all uh, love hearing your stories. And this time, though, for those of you on YouTube, 
KGA's YouTube, you can actually see some photos of some of the uh, animals and plants and moisture <laughs> that's happening around. So good morning, Jeannie. Good morning, Peggy. This beautiful morning, as you said. First of yeah. sunny morning in a long time. A oh, long time. Although we're all praying for some rain this fall, aren't we? Uh, I put my order in for early, early uh, northern storm coming down and put the fires out. Well, there you go. See, if Jeannie did it, it's going to be official. Early <laughs> rain. <laughs> uh, well, Leanne is moving some of your photos around. So uh, I don't even know where to begin today. Although I, I, I will say, and I know we're going to, maybe I'm jumping the gun here. And if I am, you we can save it till later. But Yesterday, as I went into Santa Rosa, uh, well, let me back up. For the past several days, we have been seeing everywhere up and down the coast from here to, to Fort Bragg, enormous amounts of brown pelicans, birds mm -hmm. sitting mm -hmm. on all the beaches uh, everywhere and not just pelicans, all kinds of birds. So yesterday, as we were driving to Santa Rosa, we noticed that when we got to Jenner, the brown pelicans were leaving. And at the east end of the river at Jenner, there were white pelicans. Mm -hmm. So it made us wonder, do they do that every year? I don't ever remember seeing brown and white together. So when the white brown pelicans leave, is that when they leave when the white pelicans come? <laughs> no, it's funny. Um, it's the, the American white pelicans, they, they breed inland. So when the breeding season is over, they'll disperse uh, to areas where they can find food. And the Bodega Bay area, the Russian River is a really good place for them. They often come this time of year. So we don't see the white pelicans up here very often. Uh, one year, Rick and I did see a pair uh, flying over the town of Mendocino. And we were so excited that mm -hmm. we jumped in our car and tried to follow them to no avail. But uh, it was fun to see them. But that's to see the American white pelicans, the Bodega Bay area, Jenner is the place. Um, the brown pelicans are on the move big time. They are coming and going and they breed down off of the Santa Barbara Islands. So what we're seeing now, I, I saw a huge flocks yesterday headed south and we've mm -hmm. been seeing huge flocks headed north. So it's almost like the gray whale migration where there's a progression to what they're doing. With the gray whales, we know in the, in the winter time, the first ones headed down are the pregnant females because they need to get to the lagoon. So there's a progression. So what happens with the brown pelicans is um, the, the non-breeders will head north to disperse to look for food. And then the mothers will stay and raise their chicks. And they have to wait until the young ones are strong enough to be able to fly long distances. Um, and so this is what's happening now. The, the young brown pelicans born earlier this year are the ones you're seeing in great numbers. They've obviously had a fantastic year this year. It's a, it's a successful year for them. We're seeing them in great abundance. It's very heartwarming because as we've talked about before, we almost lost these birds. Um, because of the pesticide DDT, it got in the ecosystem, it got in oh, fish right. that they fed on. They, um, their eggs became so thin that when the mother sat on them, she broke them. They were on the endangered species list. So to have them recover like this, it's just such a huge success story and uh, wonderful to see. So the young ones are the, and in fact, I had this in my notes to talk about, and I have a photo to go with it, but best laid plans. Um, the young ones have uh, brown heads and white tummies and the adults have white heads and, and brown tummies. So I have a picture if uh, Leanne can pull it up of brown pelicans in the Wallala River by Steve Wilson. And it shows a lot of young brown pelicans in the river. And it's funny because Luann Fredrickson told me, she says, I've been seeing pelicans that are a different color. And what she was seeing were the young ones. So um, it's, it's further down in the pictures that I sent. So. I can, and Leanne, if you give me the mouse, I can see the, where the picture is listed. Here we go. There we go. All right, Jeannie. Hey. Oh, yes, there this is a picture that, that yeah, Steve Wilson took. And you can see there's a lot of dark heads in this picture. Just mm -hmm. a few, just a few white headed ones with them. So these are the young ones. And I, I took a walk with young Rachel Kritz not too long ago. 
on the Wallala Bluff Trail, something I recommend everyone who's here should do on a regular basis because you can see so much wildlife from that trail. Thank you, Redwood Coast Land Conservancy. Uh, and so we were walking the trail and we saw multitudes of brown pelicans in the river. And there were several that were slapping their wings on the water. And I just thought they were, they were you know, washing the salt water off of them. Uh, that's what I've thought in the past. But a couple of them were just continuing to flap their wings in the water. So I did some research and I found out that they do that to corral fish, to, to corral fish into a, an area where the rest of their buddies can eat. So they fish cooperatively they, together. And it was fun to learn that fact about brown pelicans. I, humpback whales do that with their tails. A group of them will get together in a circle and use their tails to move uh, uh, fish like anchovies uh, closer to them, corral them. And the brown pelicans do it too in the river. So now uh, again, remind people the dark headed ones are the young ones. The, the, young. the dark headed ones are the ones that were born this year down to our south. And the white headed ones are the adults. Well, it has been amazing to see the amount of uh, pelicans and uh, other birds sitting along the shore. If you go north, you go south. It's just been wonderful to see them. And uh, I mean, who doesn't love watching pelicans when they appear to fly in formation? Or sometimes you'll see uh, elders sitting in a circle and and then they have younger ones up and it's like they're taking, you know, uh, lessons, on, you know, turn mm -hmm. left, turn right, die, right. cruise, you know, <laughs> and behave yourself <laughs> and behave yourself. Yeah. So this is it's just wonderful to see this. And thank you. This was uh, again, Steve Woodson, who's a new name. I don't remember, but uh, yeah. thank you for this. All right. Yeah. And uh, on YouTube have been looking at this. So I'm going to close. There you go. Thank you. So now, uh, now that I've interrupted your flow, we can go back to your beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Miss Peggy. <laughs> I wanted to just uh, remark on the sounds of the ospreys right now. I'm, yeah. you know, there, there's a nest that, that I get to watch for, from a spotting scope and the uh, two ospreys were successfully raised and they fledged, they had their flying lessons. And what's happening now is the young ones are giving their peeping call to be fed by their parents, but the parents are saying, hey kiddos, it's time to fish for yourself. So there's a lot of complaining and I, uh, I, I opened my column that's out today in the ICO with this hearing this young one on the nest that I watch because they come back to the nest to rest. And, uh, and he was peeping, he or she was peeping away. And then all of a sudden it rose in pitch and intensity like a child having a temper tantrum, like feed me now, feed me now. So it was fun, fun to listen. And I've been hearing this in other locations on the coast. So this is the call that the mother makes to have them to get the male to feed her when she's sitting on the nest. And it's, it's a soft peeping sound. And now it's the young ones who are doing it to try to get fed, but it's there, it's time for them to start fishing for themselves. So it's kind of fun to notice that that call going on right now, Peggy. I heard that in my yard uh, day before yesterday. And it, exactly as you're describing, as it rose in pitch and <laughs> you know, come on, come and feed me kind of thing. Uh, and uh, it was, it was wonderful to hear. And I said to myself, I thought, I bet Jeannie's going to talk about that. So <laughs> you're right. out who that was. Great. Another thing I wanted to point out right now, the huckleberries, the wild blueberries are ripe. And at least at my place, they are in abundance mm -hmm. this year. Uh, it's interesting to notice how plants and and animals respond differently to the drought. And you would think that a luscious little blueberry wouldn't do very well after such a subpar year of rainfall, but they are big and full and loaded. So if you have spots, you should check them now because they are ripe. And they don't all ripen at the same time. I mean, I have bushes that are have little green berries on them and uh, botanist Peter Bay calls that, uh, that the bushes specialize that they ripen at different times. Um, it's like the blossoms of the manzanitas, the earliest, one of the earliest blooming um, nectar plants here. They 
the, the, the bushes bloom at different times so they can help feed the hummingbirds and um, our native bees. So with the huckleberries, they provide food for a lot of, of uh, creatures other than just us two-legged ones. Uh, deer eat them, birds eat them. And as we get the migrating birds, the varied thrushes and so on, um, they will stop here for, for food on their journey. And this is also the time when you might see a bear because uh, black bears, our California black bears, they love huckleberries too. So be willing to share. If we have to, <laughs> oh, we often don't, <laughs> but we do, you know, because sometimes we don't have a choice. Uh, and I think you have the same kind of dog uh, I do in that, you know, you go out to pick your berries and that dog has berries dripping from its mouth already because <laughs> They like them too. What are you going to do? They like them too. That's right. Well, I did bring a picture to show those who are watching on YouTube of um, the fog, the droplets of fog and the moisture that it brings. And as I was talking with David Mayer the other day and he said, you know, I, I like the fog now. I used to, I used to bemoan it, but now I appreciate it because we know it keeps the humidity high and the um, fire danger low. So Carol and Andre took a photo of this fog droplets on a, uh, uh, some greenery in her garden. And it's almost like there's a whole world right there in, in that photo. Uh, it's, it's a lot of beauty to see with this uh, macro photography. So, uh, and you can, I just want to remind people if you're on YouTube, you can see that photo right now. Uh, Carol, Carol and Andre's photo of the droplets of moisture on the leaf. I too love to do that kind of photography. I'm always out there with uh, both my uh, iPhone and my, quote, real camera. So thank you, Carol. <laughs> hey, I other... want to give a shout Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, was I just want to give a quick shout out to Carol and Andre who came by the other day and dropped off some beautiful sunflowers to me. So thank oh, you. How nice. She is a wonderful gal, president of our Coastal Seniors. I so admire the work that she does. Uh, the other thing about fog I wanted to point out is that it helps the river and the Wallala River is really in um, not good shape. The, the flow levels are the lowest people who have been watching it for years have ever seen it. So the, the fog does uh, bring moisture to the river, it also stops the evaporation of the uh, water in the river. The other thing that happened with the river this last week is we had some big surf and it actually came over the sandbar and entered the uh, lagoon of the river. So where we were seeing that uh, widgeon grass that we I talked about with Leanne last month, um, it's now, right now it's submerged because the lagoon level raised over a foot from whatever happened in the river. We're not totally sure, but we're happy to see that uh, in the river right now. So that green grass that you could see from the, the bridge is uh, now submerged as it should be. Uh, so uh, the lagoon right now is great for kayaking. If you're looking for something to do this weekend, I would recommend that. The weather's going to be ideal and uh, it's good. It's always wonderful to kayak that river. You know, Jeannie, I was going to add about, you're talking about low levels. And I also think that's why we have an abundance of birds on the shore, because uh, even down in Jenner, you know, the, the, the water level is so low, it makes it really easy eating, fishing. That's that's an interesting observation, Peggy. I'm sure. I'm sure you're right. Yeah. You know that you could just see them, uh, you know, standing around in the um, at the mouth of the Russian at Jenner uh, yesterday. So, and, and same thing uh, as we went north. I can. Do you know the name of that beach that you're not allowed to go on to? That's somewhere south of Elk. Um, oh my gosh, I don't know what you're referencing. Okay. Well, <laughs> oh well. Okay. Well, should we talk about swallows then? Oh, um, let's talk about swallows. We, we ha I think the swallows had a good year too, and most of them have fledged. Uh, I, I really appreciate the business owners that allowed the nests to stay on their um, buildings because uh, they have what the swallows want, which is location, location, location. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they love to come to the Wallala Anchor Bay Sea Ranch area. They come here from many miles away and build their nests. The, the, two, the two swallows that build their nest um, are the cliff swallows and the barn swallows. And I learned that the cliff swallows like to, 
to nest in large groups. So that's what we saw on the side of the Wallala Community Center was a whole colony of cliff swallows. They also nest underneath the Wallala Bridge. So if you're gonna take my advice and kayak this weekend, look up as you, as you paddle under it and you'll see hundreds of nests. They may no longer be occupied, um, but you might see a few late latecomers still there. And then we have several other uh, swallows that come here, tree swallows and violet green swallows, and they nest in cavities. So if you put up a specially made box, a nesting box for them, like my brother-in-law does in Point Arena, Mel Smith, you might get a, a beautiful pair of birds nesting close by your home. So, and then if you put a sign that says free rent, you'll be sure to get tenants, right? <laughs> yeah, free food will really do it. <laughs> So I do have a picture to go along with this sighting that uh, Nicholas Panette sent in, and it's of a hummingbird that he oh. and his wife Kathleen found hanging upside down, uh, totally immobile. And this is called torpor, T-O-R-P-O-R. -O -R. And um, hummingbirds go into this state when the temperatures drop. And so you can see that little hummingbird is just hanging on by one, looks just like one little claw there. And it's on a branch or something in their garden. I think it is a branch. So Nicholas kept an eye on this bird as the morning sun started to warm things up and it finally began to rouse a little bit, but then the hummingbird fell off its perch and landed on the ground below still in the state of torpor. Uh, it finally revived itself and flew off. And we have no idea why this particular hummingbird was in this state for so long. But I did learn that Anna's hummingbird temperature is usually 107 degrees. They really run hot. And when outside temperatures fall, Anna's and other hummers will, can enter torpor and their body temperature can go as low as 48 degrees. Wow. Rather an interesting phenomenon. It, it, it really is. But these little guys, and I love this, this photo, and it's amazing, uh, you know, this macro shot, because that um, branch, uh, you know, looks clear, transparent almost. But, you know, these, these hummers are so resilient. And, you know, sometimes they run into your windows and their beaks get, you know, twisted and then they sh run away, shake it off. And later on, you see them and their beaks are fine or, and they're very ferocious fighters for territory. And, you, you know, that's, a, if you watch your humming, uh, hummers a lot, I mean, they are always fighting and there's always some little, elder who wins all the fights, who then goes and grabs the highest branch to sit on and starts singing, you know, a, a, a winner's fighting song. I mean, that's the only way I can explain it because that's how they, it's how he looks, you know, it's like, okay, I won out of my garden. This is mine that's now. Right. All my nectar. <laughs> that's right. So that, the, I also brought you a picture of a beetle because we talked about you saw oh, this beetle yeah. in Anchor Bay and you wondered you tried to get a photo and you couldn't. And Krista Dial did get a picture of this beautiful iridescent green and gold and oh, it's just so gorgeous beetle. And it is called the golden jewel beetle. And its job in nature is to decompose dead wood. Um, so I sent this picture to entomologist Will Erickson to get the identification. And he says it was this very beetle that got him interested in entomology. So I thought that was kind of wonderful. So it's this was beautiful. taken by, by uh, Krista, Krista Dial. So thanks Krista for sharing your photo. And do you think this was the beetle you saw? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely Great. the beetle that kept eluding me. <laughs> Show itself and as soon as I'd point a camera at it, it would be gone, but this is it. And they are just gorgeous. Yes. All right. Wonderful. I'm Thank glad we. I'm glad we got it for you. Golden jewel beetle. And YouTube viewers, you are getting to see all of these uh, insects, animals, plants that Jeannie is describing. So uh, it's a wonderful use of our being able to talk with Jeannie and share her photos that she gets from her. her who knows how many photographers she has in her folders? And yesterday, when I was watching those pelicans, I said to Susan, "I said, 
I'm not going to worry. I don't have a camera because Jeannie will have some photographer out there somewhere who's taking all of these shots. <laughs> Indeed, I'm very, yeah. I'm very grateful to all the beauty that comes in my inbox every day. It's a wonderful thing that people love to share and be a part of this uh, Mendenoma sightings phenomenon. Uh, and this this here was taken by, um, I, we're looking at a pair of gray fox kits. And I didn't get a whole lot of photos this year of the, of kits, but Sarah Bogart did watch a oh. small a small family uh, on the Point Arena Stornetta lands. And there's just two kits that are snuggled up together. And it's it was interesting because Mary Highbill called me to tell me about a walk that she took on the lands and she was by herself and it was in the early morning and she feels that she wouldn't have had this sighting if she had been with someone else or if she had had a dog because she was very quiet as she walked along and she came across a gray fox adult that was sleeping in the grass and the adult and would have been the, the mother I would think well I don't know who could have been the father but anyway the, the adult got up and, and sat and looked at her as she slowly went by and then she saw two gray fox kits as she got closer to the bluff. And where she was, was where one of the big sinkholes are, and uh, or is, I should say. And the one fox ran over the edge of the bluff and down into the sinkhole, and the other little one followed behind. So I don't know if they're using that as a safe place. It would be a great safe place from any predators, um, but it was interesting that she got to have that experience and she felt quite blessed to have that. So a wonderful. Wonderful uh, reason to be quiet as you walk along. Don't they look so soft? Yeah, they do. They're so cute. Know, they're very cute. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. And I don't have any photos to show of this, but I was taken by Laura Baker. She's a wonderful naturalist in our area to see a colony of digger bees. And they're also on the lands. And uh, it's, I, I don't want to say exactly where because it's quite uh, delicate but it was, I had never seen digger bees before. I, I don't know uh, much about them yet, but the, the females, they actually dig into the soft sandstone. And once they're, they are satisfied with the, what they have dug, then they will lay their eggs in there. They'll also bring food before they lay their eggs. So when the eggs hatch, there will be food for their offspring. So it was quite um, beautiful and, and serene. And, and yes, uh, there is a photo that I brought that Mary Lou uh, Flint took of one of our native bees, a couple of our native pollinators. And our most common bumblebee is the yellow-faced bumblebee. And it's in this photo, there, it's feeding on Coast Angelica, a wonderful nectar plant, a native plant here. But she also photographed a, a bee you don't see as often, another native bee called the sweat bee. And it's quite a bit slender, more slender than the uh, bumblebee. Well, bumblebees are known for being robust, right? We wonder how the heck they can actually fly. Um, so they're both feeding very peacefully on this uh, one blossom. And it's just nice to know that the pollinators are out doing, doing their work. And yep. I, yeah, I'm getting a little bit out of order with how I intended to tell my story here. So maybe we could switch back to, um, switch over to scenes talking about whales. And Eric Zetterholm and Amy Ruder were coming uh, back home, I believe, and they were on the Myers grade when they saw a spout. And he took photos of it and, uh, and he shared them with me. I shared them with Scott and Tree Mercer. And it turned out that they saw a blue whale. The photos were quite a ways away, so I didn't uh, uh, offer you one today. But Later, he and Amy were on the Wallala Bluff Trail and they were photograph. he was photographing and they were admiring all the sights and they turned to leave and for whatever reason they stopped and turned back and they saw a gray whale spy hopping right off the shore. And Eric got a great photo of one of the spy hops and there's a couple on the beach with a dog and I just, I did not hear from them. I don't know if they were visitors or locals, but they were just so close. It must have been incredible for them to see this. Uh, Eric said that the, um, the whale actually came into the surf and rolled around in the sand. So what a beautiful sighting. Spy hopping is where the, the, the whale rises, it raises its head out of the water 
and you can actually see the, the eye. And we don't know if it's looking around, maybe curious at us, or if it's listening for the, um, the break of the, the water to give, it, give itself its coordinates. But in this case, it was a wonderful sighting and Eric's talent of a, as a photographer lets us all see it. I also have this shared on my, my blog, mendonomasightings.com. Well, you know, it also tells me something about the depth of the water there, mm -hmm. you know, yes. Uh, yes. and in, in order for it to do that kind of a spy hop. And, uh, but the person doesn't look like they're looking at the way. <laughs> I hope they, uh, but you know, it's amazingly how silent, if you've ever been outside and seen this happen, I've never seen it this close, but you know, they're very quiet. These gigantic yes. mammals, they just come up. And then they come back down and it's amazingly quiet. So thank you, Eric, for this. I just love seeing that. And uh, how cool is that? That is just, don't you always feel so blessed when you see a whale? Oh, you absolutely. Know, been, been a back whale? anything. Yeah. Absolutely. Dolphin. Yeah, I totally agree. It's like a gift. And I, I do think this man was looking at the whale. I have several photos. Oh, I, think okay. it was, I think it was a man and a woman. And a dog, but we're looking at his back, so um, I don't think he could not. They were looking at it. They, were, they definitely <laughs> were. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, and Eric, uh, not Eric, but Mike Petrich got a great photo of a humpback breaching, which I have included here today. If, if Leanne can bring it up for your people who are watching, uh, this is the time of year that you might see humpback whales and blue whales as they're dispersing also to um, for f reasons for food and. Uh, the humpbacks give birth to the south and they'll often bring their calves up here. And Mike was uh, out with his partner, Karen Wilkinson. They're doing uh, nature journaling and he brought his camera with him and he got a wonderful photo of a, of a humpback whale breaching and you're showing it wow. now. It's wow, just the, the classic, classic, wonderful shot of the water cascading off of one of the flippers as the whale propels itself through the air. Very, very joyous. And he only got this one, one photo. So, uh, and I don't know if the rest of the group saw it as they were you know, doing whatever nature journaling they were doing, but Mike was looking out and he was rewarded with this sighting and we get to share in it. Thank you, Mike. That's just an all around great photo. Just the colors, the, the ocean, you know, the, everything about it. Uh, congratulations. What, yeah. what a joy it's you a know, beauty. to do that. And of course, thank you. Jeannie Jackson of Mendonoma Sightings, who is our guest this morning on Peggy's Place and her um, weekly uh, column comes out today in the ICO. And of course, uh, you, if you're on YouTube, KGOA's YouTube, you're able to see these amazing photos um, that have been shared by photographers. Some of them are professional some are just everyday people uh, who are getting really great shots uh, and uh, we get to see them. Thank you, Jeannie. Yeah, By the way, welcome to KGUA in Wallala. <laughs> At the ocean's edge. <laughs> At the ocean's edge. Uh, Sherry Goforth Ebby is also watching the, the water for uh, gray whales and she has been identifying some of them that she's uh, seen more than once. And a recent one that she named was Da Dit Da. And she's seen it several times. Um, she names it for the markings on their bodies and their tails. So she said that she hasn't seen too many recently. Um, these are the resident gray whales, the, the ones that did not migrate to the Arctic. It's a fairly new phenomenon over the past few years. And I really appreciate her efforts in um, identifying them and cataloging them. And I wanna wish her uh, the best of luck on her um, knee surgery that she has uh, coming up and, wow. and hope that she'll be back out spotting whales for us very soon. So we don't have a, uh, we don't see one of her photos in this. No, I didn't. Okay. Think. I, I pulled this together at the last minute when Leanne said we can share them. So at quarter after eight, I was pulling photos and I barely <laughs> made it on the air. <laughs> I think we're going to try to have me show them next month. And from my PC, so um, well, I just need a, it's a little bit of a learning curve for me. So we'll, we'll work that out and hopefully have it a little smoother for next time. But I also want to remember that there are people listening and can't see the photos. And I want to make sure that 
that I describe them enough for those that need a, a mental picture drawn for them. Um, I do have a photo to show those that are watching of Riso's dolphins. And this was a really fun sighting because they were first seen that I know of by John Batchelder off of the Sea Ranch. And they were a ways out, but he got some pretty good photos, but he let me know about it so I could let others know about the sighting. And they were headed north. And Craig Tooley, who is a professional photographer, he got out there with this long lens and got some really good photos of them. And they were moving fast. They were headed north. And where they were headed for was they were headed for Sanders Reef, Hearn Gulch area. So I, I don't know how it works with any of these marine animals, how they find out that the dinner bell has rung. But there was the food that they like off of this part of the coast. And they were just swimming as fast as they could to get there. And once they got there, then the other um, people got to see them and they stayed for several hours. And I think another pod came from the north and joined them. So the dinner bell was rung and uh, people were calling the ICO. Riso's dolphins are often mistaken for killer whales. They've got that tall dorsal fin, but of course they're much smaller. And, um, and if you see the two side by side, it, 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 you realize your mistake. And I actually had a friend tell me that she had seen orcas also, but they were Risos dolphins, which is a wonderful sighting. I love these dolphins and we had a nice pod stay here. Sherry got to see them for several hours as they fed and they, they would, uh, she said that they gathered in ovals to fish together and quite a wonderful sighting. This what the day I, we're what having I, today, the day we're having today with no wind could be a great uh, day to see uh, marine animals. So yeah, keep an eye out everybody. Well, the other thing I have to say about Craig's photo and Craig is awesome uh, is the, uh, what appears to be a smile. <laughs> the, yep. the most, you know, the, the dolphin that is closest to us and is out of the water and just the nature of their design, but it looks like it's just smiling. And that's one thing you don't see killer whales do. <laughs> they don't <laughs> smile. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> they, they just look awesome and you just want to get out of their way and they're so fast. But thank that's you right. for that. I just yeah. love that smiling. Those. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll take all the smiles we can get here these days. Um, yes. the other, other thing notice, to notice on the ocean here is the kelp forest has, is really, really uh, healthy this year. It's so wonderful to see. Bruce Jones mentioned that, that he said it's as thick as he's ever seen it. And we know that we had a, a big lack of it. We had the ocean was out of balance when the sea stars got the wasting disease. And then the sea urchins who will eat everything and anything um, ate the kelp also. And that put a, a lot of other uh, marine creatures in crisis, including the abalone. So it's wonderful to see it back. The kelp forest uh, plays a big role in the ecosystem of the ocean. And, and this just, this is wonderful to see. The sea stars are back and it seems like things are in much better balance. We did have an interesting sighting. I don't have a photo of it, but Dave Tettleton is a fisherman here. And he was fishing off of elk, maybe that unknown beach. We don't know the name for Peggy. And he saw a, a mula mula, also called a, an ocean uh, sunfish, I believe. Yeah, ocean sunfish, that's right. They are normally found in temperate water. So to have one show up here is, is a, a little rare. I have had a sighting of one before. They're the most unusual fish you could ever ever hope to see. They are as tall as they are long, and they look like someone took two big paddles together and squished them because they're very, very slender. And the no. other thing that's strange, <laughs> they're huge. They're huge. Dave estimates the one he saw was 1,500 pounds, oh and then they can be larger than that. And the other thing that's so strange about them is they have pink lips. So if, if you're looking at them head on, you're just seeing this extremely slender, huge fish with pink lips. Just amazing. Mother Nature has a lot of fun sometimes. 
kind of like bumblebees because you wonder how does that thing swim <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly wow Dave uh, and a big shout out to him too he is a wonderful fisherman and uh i've got to taste some of salmon that he had caught recently and this kind of goes back you were talking about the um anchovies i think yes i think it was anchovies and and he said this salmon is very pink and it's very sweet and he just wondered if it had to do with the excess of anchovies they were eating i, I think it i think it very well could be absolutely uh i've had pictures uh, fishermen have sent me in the past when they've cut open fish and found it stuffed with anchovies so uh, mm -hmm. when the anchovies are here it's just like a huge buffet is open on the ocean and so many uh, marine creatures and also um, seabirds feed on it. So it's a, it's a really amazing phenomenon. How many anchovies must there be in the ocean? Billions of <laughs> untold billions, just amazing. Well, you're listening to Jeannie Jackson of Mendenhama Sightings and, and I just have to say, this is one of the joys of Mendenhama Sightings is they are local people whether they are local fishermen, uh, fisherwomen, whether they are just citizens walking along, seeing things, taking pictures, people paying attention to the world around us. That is the joy of Mendenoma sightings. And then a lot of times uh, if needed, uh, or whether it's needed or not, Jeannie calls on scientists to help us understand what it is we're seeing. So you are, you get an amazing education, just reading Jeannie Jackson's column uh, and uh, listening to the show. And those of you who are lucky enough to be watching on YouTube are getting to see some phenomenal photos. <laughs> so moving away from the ocean, Craig, who took this photo of the recess, he photographed a black-tailed rabbit, got a really nice photo of one. And I get to see them uh, at our place in Anchor Bay uh, on a regular basis, I, I, I kind of scared one in the forest uh, interface yesterday, and it's just so fun to see them. They had young ones this year. And so I, you're showing a picture that Craig took of one. And I just don't want us to not, I don't want us to take them for granted. They're part of the ecosystem here. And I have a fun fact for you. They can run as fast as 30 miles per hour, and they can jump 20 feet. And the, <laughs> The other thing, the mother, what the mother does when she has young ones is she has multiple um, nests that she moves them to keep them safe as she's rearing them. So they're fun. To, we have two, two rabbits here, the brush rabbits, the little, little bunnies, people call them, and these larger ones with the big ears. And the beautiful and I, I, brown eyes. They're just beautiful. They really are. Wow. And then wow. we've... We had the good news uh, last month when I talked with Leanne of the bald eagles birthing two healthy chicks this year and they fledged and people have been getting photos of them. And I have a photo that uh, Jim Garlock took to show here on the, your YouTube of the two juvenile bald eagles in a tree. And one of the adults is at the top as if to um, be looking over them or keep them in line. Um, Jim Garlock lives in the Wallala area and he overlooks the snag that the bald eagles often like to perch in. And you can see this uh, dead tree for yourself if you would go behind where Trinks is um, to the north end of the Wallala Bluff Trail and then look to the north and there is a very large dead tree and that's where the bald eagles like to hang out. I often see them there. I'm sorry, Jeannie, I'm not finding that photo. All righty. Well, maybe maybe I didn't get it to you, so we won't worry about it. I do but what's been body. what's been happening? And I do I do know I sent you one of the bald eagle in the air that Craig Tooley took with its talons up. Yes, yes that's there the one I'm mentioning. So what we've been seeing is a lot of fighting between some of these top yeah. of the food chain raptors. And Craig took a photo of a peregrine falcon. It's a little hard to see in the photo. It's in the upper right corner and harassing a bald eagle. And the bald eagle has flipped over onto its back in the air and its, its talons are, are uh, upward towards the peregrine to fight him off. And these two actually were dive bombing each other. The peregrine had the bald eagle land in uh, one of the kelp beds. And they, they were fine, but it was just 
kind of like what you talked about with the hummingbirds, a dominance thing. And one of the things that Diane Hitchwa has mentioned to me, and she's a past president of a Sonoma Audubon, so my, my bird expert, and she helps me so much, I really appreciate her. And she's telling me that some of the birds that are nesting on Willala Point Island have been disturbed by the hunting of these, these predators and by some of their battles. And on the Willala Point Island or GPI is a very important rookery for seabirds. And some of these seabirds are quite shy and they only come to land to, to uh, birth their chicks. So one of them, the birds are common mures. And you wouldn't believe how many are on the island because we can't, we can only see one side of the island. And I asked Diane about that and I, I wrote it down here. Let's see, let me get my notes here. I'm getting out of order here. There, there were several, there were 2,183 common mures on the island this <laughs> spring and early summer. They did, uh, they did yeah. drone. They did drone photography, so they were able to count them. So, you know, some wonderful person took the time to do that. And there were over 100 Brant's cormorants nests on the island. But what they found were some of the common muir nests were abandoned, uh, eggs were loose and rolling around, and they feel it was the disturbance because of these big raptors here. So it's actually to be determined how much the nesting seabirds will be affected by the fact that we now have bald eagles pretty much year round here in the Wallala area and that the peregrine falcons have also returned in recent years and successfully uh, fledged chicks. So um, things going on that we're gonna be watching in the months to come. Great, and another wonderful photo. Yes. So the common muirs have left, recently left, and that's a lot of muirs, 2,100 plus. And the fun thing about the muirs is that the mother obviously lays the eggs and raises them. But once they're able to fly off the island, and it truly is a leap of faith off the island for the fledglings, the, the fathers take over. And the mothers are free to do whatever they want, have a spa day, um, <laughs> go out for ice cream. Um, and the fathers take over the, the raising of their fledglings. So there's a time when there's calling, the fathers are calling to their offspring to come off the island and join them in the water. And that has taken place and they're gone. So we'll, hopefully we'll see them in big numbers again next spring. And I did ask uh, Diane how the Western gulls did. They, the Western gulls are the only gulls that nest here. A lot of, you see a lot of, of different gulls over the winter. But in the spring, the only one we have is the Western, the, the gray and the white ones. And she said that they had, let's see, there were, it's too tiny of, too tiny of printing here. I believe we had 15 successful um, Western gulls off of this uh, very special island off the Sea Ranch. And it's a wonderful island to get to see, very peaceful. But there's a lot of things that will attack Western gull nest, and some of them are your favorite birds, the common ravens. Um, so they all don't come to adulthood. So we celebrate those that do. Yes, 15, 15 successfully raised chicks. Yeah, and we, we talked about the brown pelicans. So that brings me to um, acorn woodpeckers. And I do have a photo to share that Thane uh, Frivold took, if I pronounced his last name right. You know Thane, is it? Yes, we like to call him our Thane. Our Thane. Uh, yes, Thane is a volunteer here at KGUA. He also works with Philo TV. Ah, there we have a humming. I mean, um, yes, what you were saying, a woodpecker. <laughs> Red hair. Yeah, he got he got a photo of a female acorn woodpecker at his hummingbird feeder, and it turns out that acorn woodpeckers have very long tongues that they could put in the the tubes of the feeders and get the nectar and they like their sweet treats too. So he also got a, a short video of it, which I have shared on my website if people are interested to see it. Um, I have seen uh, acorn woodpeckers do this myself. So it's, uh, it's, it's not unheard of, but it's kind of a fun thing to see. Did I lose you, Peggy? You know, I'm, can you hear me? I can hear you. So that's good. 
That's I'm, good. I'm here right? for some reason. Uh, it's all right. I don't need to be on screen, but we have the beautiful uh, woodpecker and we can hear you. And uh, here, Leanne is bringing you back into the video. So uh, we, and by the way, I just want to let you know, we're down to about nine minutes. So oh but we're gosh. doing good. Where yeah. does the time go? I don't know. I, I just wanted, I don't have a photo to show, but Richie Washer, Wasserman uh, saw a covey of uh, quail, California quail chicks, and a lot of little babies that look like little rocks. And uh, he watched them as they took a dust bath. And this was, was a fun thing for him to see as the dust was flying. I've actually seen this in my garden too. And I'm not quite sure um, why the quail do this. And I'll have to I'll have to do a little research on that, but it is something that quail are known for doing. But I had a, a male uh, quail land on my deck railing and the sun hit its feathers. And just for a moment, I just, I caught my breath because it was just so beautiful, uh, the iridescent colors on that, on that male bird. Um, we have a, a, a event that's been going on here for some years now with the uh, Vox's Swifts and the bird that likes to nest in old chimneys. And there is an old brick chimney down in, at Stewart's Point. I think it's the old schoolhouse, if I'm not mistaken. And they come this time of year in large numbers to uh, go in there and, and rest, roost overnight. So it's, a, it's an event that you can watch now and for maybe the next couple of weeks and you go at dusk. So just don't uh, park in the two fish parking area. They do have a business to run. But it's a, it is a fun <laughs> event brought to you by Mother Nature here. And then um, Michelle Melio had a nice walk on Salal Creek, the Salal Trail. Um, a lot of people don't even know how to get to this trail, but the trailhead is actually at Wallala Point Regional Park. If you turn into the first parking area, you turn left into the first parking area and then to the uh, left is the actual entrance to the Salal Trail. And it's a wonderful trail that goes along Highway 1 by the golf course and then turns uh, towards the west and you're walking along Salal Creek. There's a beautiful waterfall to find when, when the uh, water levels are higher. And she, she just noted that there were a lot of insect eaters, a lot of birds that eat insects along that trail. So I think that the creek itself uh, is conducive for insects. And then that attracts uh, birds like the Wilson's warblers and, and others to come and, and feed. But she saw a black Phoebe, which is always a treat. She also mentioned that she visited the Mendocino Botanical Gardens to see the dahlias. So even though that's not so much a normal Mendonoma sighting, I love the botanical gardens up in Fort Bragg. And I have, Rick and I have visited when the dahlias are in bloom and they are incredible. So I, I recommend that as a stop. As a stop, not yeah. a stop in today's show. As no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a... It's, it's wonderful to go there and walk and you can take a picnic. There are places to stop, you know, benches, whatever. It, it is just wonderful, um, you know, to go there. And Leanne, you are doing such a fantastic job as she always does, helping us uh, get through these more complicated shows. A reminder, you're listening to KGUA in Wallala, uh, right at the ocean, and you may be watching us on KGA's YouTube channel to see some of these amazing photos. And you, then you also get to see Jeannie Jackson and I uh, just talking with each other as, as we love to do. And her column comes out today in the local newspaper, the Independent Coast Observer. And Jeannie, remind people what your website is because uh, they may want to go and see some of the other photos that are there. Absolutely. It's mendonomasightings.com. Mendo for Mendocino and Noma for Sonoma. So going on with my sightings here as we're running out of time, I found it interesting. Brenda Phillips photographed a garter snake eating a banana slug. And I have an expert for lizards and snakes, and, and his name is Gary Nafis. He has a wonderful website if you're interested in this type of sighting. It's called California Herps, H-E-R-P s.com and um, he identified her garter snake as a coast garter snake and the 
reason that he picked coast over Oregonian is because coast garter snakes are known to eat banana slugs. And he told me that banana, uh, that, co that coast garter snakes, if they are inland, they don't eat banana slugs. So I don't know why, I just thought that was interesting that because they're in <laughs> abundance here, they've made it part of their diet. I don't think it's easy for them to eat one because they froth at the, at the mouth as they're doing so. It's a very unusual sighting to see. The uh, banana slugs froth at the mouth. The the the. Oh, I think it. I think it's the banana slug being eaten that frosts. Uh, mm. One of our golden retrievers managed to get one in his mouth one year uh, with Sunny, the one that I wrote my children's books uh, featuring, mm. and he he got one in his mouth, and I had to try to get it out, and it was frothing, <laughs> and it was not fun. <laughs> But you do what you have to do for your fur faces, don't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we did mention the California black bears. And I had Alan Ellis called me a couple of weeks ago. And he said, do we have bears here? And I said, we sure do, Alan. His wife was hiking with their golden retriever, Jojo, by the green bridge of the Wallala River. And they saw a large, dark animal. And so, I, as I said earlier, don't be surprised if you might see one this time of year because of the ripe huckleberries. They love huckle. One of my favorite photos is of a, a black bear in a huckleberry patch surrounded by bushes. And he just looks, he or she just looks so happy. So how are we doing time-wise, Peggy? About uh, two minutes, we have Piper's Elegans by Peter Bay that we haven't seen. Okay, let's show that. And I'd really like to show the, uh, the emerging elegant sheep moth also. So we, we have these beautiful um, orchids. There's a whole uh, group of orchids that bloom on the coast. And this is one of them. Uh, the, would you, you pronounce it there, Peggy? I've got my, oh, it's P Peperia elegance. And um, it's, the, the orchids are very slender and the flowers are very small. So you really have to pay attention to see them. Oh, um, so it's, Asparagus. The, this it, the stalk does look a lot like asparagus. I've noticed that myself. So this one is just starting to open. Flowers are quite tiny, and this one's a, a bit of a rare photo, um, a rare plant. I mean, and then the other photo that I wanted to show and to talk about because it's so cool that Mike Petrich got again. He's the one who got the the uh, humpback breaching. This is of a beautiful moth that is seen this time of year. I just got a sighting of one from Grace O'Malley and she thought it was a butterfly. And, um, and I don't blame her because it's an incredibly beautifully marked uh, moth. They're a summer moth uh, that we see, they're di diurnal, they're seen during the day. And Mike caught this one moth actually emerging from its pupa. <laughs> and it's just coming out of, of what we would call a cocoon and uh, becoming uh, the next phase of its life, which would be uh, airborne. So it's just so fun to see they're pink and orange and black, and they're just incredibly beautiful. So keep Tiny. an eye out for this. Tiny wings. Um, that's gonna be it, Jeannie Jackson. Thank you so much. And for preparing all of these photos until sadly until next month. and. And who knows, you may be here live or you will do it like this again. All of our YouTube viewers, thank you so much for joining us. And did you get a treat seeing all of these wonderful photos? I just can't get over those. That smiling Riso's dolphin and uh, that beetle. I mean, so many things that, that, that we got to see. And of course, this will be on um, our YouTube uh, archive. So Jeannie, you have a great day. And uh, we will be in touch. Always good to see you. And good to see you, have Peggy. a great time. We have to leave everybody now and head to Native of.